Welcome to Jesus and Me, your place to go for Sunday's message from Kingsville Community Church. In week four of his series, Jesus Strong, People Driven, Pastor Tom Harmon, lead pastor of KCC, talks about how we need to be driven by positive qualities that the Holy Spirit is producing in our lives. And now, here's Pastor Tom. We're going on and continuing with our series in Titus, Jesus Strong, People Driven. And we want to talk about being Jesus strong and driven by the positive qualities that God has placed within our lives. That's what we want to be driving us. We certainly don't want other things driving us. We want those positive qualities that God has given to us. And we just welcome those of you who may be joining us through the internet today on our internet stream. And you're just as much a part of this service as everyone else is. And we are so glad that you are here with us. As well, too, if you're visiting with us, there is a special gift for you on the table out in the foyer, on the upper foyer to my right. And uh, there's a, a book that we'd just like you to take home and enjoy reading. It's got some great information in it, and it's a wonderful coffee table type of book. And so we hope that you enjoy that. And please feel free to take that. I am so thankful for what God has given to our church and every demographic that is in our church. It is really, really uh, important that uh, we have a church that is multi-generational because they have, each generation has so much to give to each other. We can learn so much from each other and we can accomplish so much more together walking in unison and in unity with what God is doing and what God is birthing and envisioning in our midst. And I'm so thankful for the support of the congregation and I'm thankful, I'd just like to say thank you to all of our leaders. I'd like to say thank you to everybody who uh, came out on Wednesday. 12 people came out to uh, do maintenance and cleaning in our church. They cleaned from the sanctuary all the way through the cafe, the washrooms. I mean, they gave it a good scrubbing. The windows were washed. There was a number of things that were fixed in the area. And just thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for looking after the, the uh, bulletin boards. Great job. And it's just, you know, I walk in, the bulletin boards are done, and I think, praise the Lord, Lynn's been here. She's done a great job. As she does that, just looks after it every season. And it, it, I tell you something, it means a lot. It really does. It means a lot. I am thankful for those who are involved in our children's ministry. And, you know, last year when we went to two services, Sarah was a little bit apprehensive, like two services. Where am I going to find the workers and the helpers? We made it one of our prayer requests that uh, we would pray that there would be 12 people serving in our children's ministry every Sunday morning. And, and we're getting close to that as God is answering that prayer and, and touching people's hearts to be a part of children's ministry. But this time when we said, well, we're going to two services on Thanksgiving, she said, oh, we need that because we are packed. We are full downstairs. We've got 22 kids in the ark room like, ah, help. You know, we, and and our, our parking lot is, is, got, uh, uh, is, is full and, and all of those things. And our J kids, that's our week, uh, midweek ministry, uh, has gone from about seven or eight kids to 18 to 20 kids. And we're praying as well that God would just put it on another couple's heart to uh, connect with Brandon and Sarah and, and to join with them and, and walk with them and, and, and to help them out and to kind of partner with them in children's ministry because that is, is so needed. Because God is doing a great thing in the church of today. The church of today is our children's ministry. And folks, if we lose that church, we are sunk. We, we can write the epitaph, put it out on the front lawn, because that's what's happening to a lot of churches when, they don't, uh, when they're not relevant and when they don't have kids. But we've got kids. Now, today in our nursery, we don't have any children in our nursery, okay? But we've got seven babies. And I, I said to Roseanne, I said, you know, it's kind of like sitting there and looking at this avalanche that's just about to fall. And when it does, it's going to be wild in that nursery, let me tell you. And uh, yeah, and we're adding more and adding more to our youth and young adult leaders. I am so thankful for the leadership. And it was a year ago that we uh, brought in a new staff member. And at just a step of faith, we, we brought in um, Katie and, and, and Kyle. And it's nice to have your 
parents here this morning, Kyle. Jeff and Joanne, hello there, folks. They're joining us just for, uh, for our Thanksgiving service, and um, they are doing a great job, let me tell you. He's a great drummer, too. We really like it. Don't, isn't that great drumming, folks, this morning in ministry? Well, let me tell you, you come out here on youth night with youth and junior highs. We've got a whole pile of young adult leaders helping uh, Katie and Kyle with that group. Thank God for you guys. You're doing a great job. And you have the numbers to show it as the youth is just growing and growing and growing. Thank God for that. And, and I just, I just want to say thank God for all of you that are involved in our youth and our children's ministries. Oh, by the way, for children's ministries, next week we're having an appreciation breakfast for you downstairs between services. So if you'd like to be a part of the children's ministry, talk to Sarah and Brandon. And you don't get breakfast because you're just coming in. But <laughs> we'll catch up and we'll make it up to you later. Connect group teachers and leaders. That's a part of our group, our part of our church. Our church is very simple. A Sunday morning celebration, open door, connect group. And, and become a part of the life of the church and use your gifts. And man, I'll tell you, we've got five connect group, groups running. Our leaders are doing a great job and they're going to help. Our connect group leaders are going to help be a part of our prayer team on Sunday morning and be joining and praying with people. But we believe that it's healthy, spiritually healthy, and people will grow when they get apart and get involved in Connect Group. I think it's indispensable for Christian discipleship and fellowship. For all of our volunteers at the community center, God bless you. There are many here. Everything that takes place pretty much in the community center is volunteer. And, you know, three years ago, uh, Rob uh, Nelson and, and Connie and myself and Candy, we sat down at uh, the Nelson's uh, table in their kitchen, and we wondered, what now? What now? We had been instrumental in getting the gleaners in Leamington up off of the ground. Candy was their administrative uh, person. Uh, uh, Rob was on the board. I was the chaplain, and, and, and Rob was kind of the imp impetus to start that thing in the first place years before, getting out and talking about gleaners and bringing it here. But now we, we had kind of new board members had come on, come on and, 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 you know, I, chaplain uh, wasn't necessary in that. And so we're sitting there going, well, what now? And we thought we'd start this little community center that would hobble along for three or four or five years, be on Tuesday and Thursday mornings, and we would, you know, we, we'd maybe get seniors cooking together, a big pot of stew, and they could divide it up and take it home, and they'd have food for the week and stuff like that. And we'd have a little knitting group, and I thought, a knitting group, who needs a knitting group? You know, a couple of old ladies sitting around with knitting needle. And so we started this community center, and it was like stepping on a treadmill that was going 100 miles an hour. Honestly, folks, it hasn't stopped. We've grown another uh, one-third over last year. Last year at this time, we, uh, we had, uh, or last year, for the whole year, we had serviced in our programs over 6,000 people. We're past that now this year, and we still got three months to go, four months to go. And it, this, this year, we, we began something called Compassion Care Network. Uh, we got involved in that. We didn't begin it. We got involved in it at its very grassroots level. Uh, they, uh, some people approached us from hospice and said, you might want to be interested in this. It's just starting. And we went and talked to the people that were implementing that. And, and we were part on the ground floor implementing that in our community center. And, you know, t today, today we, uh, we are the, the one that is running successfully. And, and they uh, had me on a, on a conference call this week. It scares me to death from Kingston, uh, northern Ontario, Toronto, where they are trying to take what we do here and replicate it for, for uh, preventative health care throughout the whole province. And it scares me to death because I'm like, how did, how did this happen? We're just a small church in Kingsville. How did, it, how did this happen? But you know what? It's because God's in it and God is, is blessing what's happening. This, this week, we 
celebrated and honored Candy Flood, who's been our center director. And Candy is stepping down from being the director. She's still on the board, but what's happened is it's outgrowing what she's able to do. So she is taking a very specialized area in our in our center, and she is the one that's heading up the nursing program that comes from the University of Windsor. And they bring nurses here, and the nurses do their internship here in community nursing. And so we need to have somebody who's a registered nurse who can work with those, uh, those students in the nursing realm, so, and set a curriculum up and, and get them going. So Candy is taking on that aspect of the center. Lynn McCormick and, uh, is stepping in as the coordinator of the center and Paula Forrester as the administrator. Everything in the center is actually volunteer. All the programs, 33 programs we offer through the center, all volunteers from the community doing everything. And God bless every one of them, folks. We say thank you, Jesus, for what you have brought into our church and into our center and allowing us to reach out into our community with the love of Jesus. Love in action. That's our vision. That's what we do. We put love into action. And our purpose is to love, to teach, and to reach people for Jesus Christ. So I am so thankful for everybody a part of that. I'm thankful for our host teams. And we had some new folks join us in our host team this week, Sue and, uh, Susan and, and Rick. And uh, you know what? Rick was so nervous. He, he came to me and says, I've been practicing this morning how to greet people. And I'm wondering, should, should I say Happy Thanksgiving or, or what should I say? I said, just don't wish them a Merry Christmas and you'll be all right. But I mean, they make you, feel, they serve you every Sunday. They make sure that, that you find, uh, that you're comfortable in here, that the temperature is good, that there's hot coffee and, and muffins and cookies and all of that in the cafe. They look after things. They look after the information table and, 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 and desk down there and, and, and all the stuff in between that goes on Sunday morning as people are coming into the church. Thank you for everybody who, well, who, who works in that area. Thank you so much because you make this a friendly environment. I, I want to just say thank you to our music and media ministry for the time and the talent and the passion that they put into everything that they do. And I just want to congratulate our sound man back there, uh, Pete Slingerland, and his wife, Amanda. On Friday, Amanda uh, gave birth to Thomas William Slingerman. So congratulations, Peter. Bless you. And, th and that's the best first name you could have ever named a child, I'll tell you. That's a good, strong name, Thomas. <laughs> and to our young at heart, who will reach seniors, and this, this coming uh, October, we're kicking it off with Nicole Barron, who is a recording artist. She's got CDs and stuff out there. She just came back from being in Africa for about three weeks doing ministry and teaching, and she's connected with our congregation, but she's going to be ministering in music at Young and Heart. So this is something you not only want to get yourself out to, but you want to get friends out to as well. Just make sure you do one thing, okay? Please let us know you're coming. Please. Because I want to eat a lot of food that day, okay? And if we don't know you're coming and you show up, then I got to give you a portion off of my plate. So let's make sure we have enough food. Let us know you're coming. Let us know your friends are coming. And let's just have a great young at heart. And then, you know, this morning we had our first uh, service. It was well filled up. It was well attended. And to today, this is well attended. And uh, I, I said thank you to all these people. And you know, you always forget somebody. And uh, you know, I, Connie said, you forgot the divas. Well, thank you to all the divas who, for some reason or other, every time we mention you, you go honk, honk, honk in the service. I just can't thank you enough for that. <laughs> well, we have a lot to be thankful for. And, and I just, I am so thankful for every person that makes this church the great church that it is. And, and I believe that what Jesus wants to do in our sermon this morning is that we need to be Jesus strong people that are driven by the positive qualities that the Holy Spirit has placed in our lives. We're a church that works together all generations towards a positive vision 
of moving forward and putting love into action and a positive purpose of loving God and others, of teaching the scriptures and being taught ourselves and reaching out to our community and reaching out to our world. And we're doing that and we're doing it successfully for only one reason and that is because you support it and thank you so much for what you're doing through the love of God, the positive qualities that you bring. And so Titus, Titus deals with those qualities that we need to see and have in our congregation. And Paul challenges us to have those qualities and put them forward and in front of us as we serve Jesus in the body of believers. Paul contrasts the negative results of the false teachers that he talked about in in chapter 1 to these positive qualities that need to be found in those people who are members of the congregation of that church. And so he writes to Titus, and I believe the message through this is simple, that we need to be driven by positive qualities that the Holy Spirit is producing in our lives. We need to keep them first. And Paul deals with a number of areas of the demographics of that church. And he believes, he, he b- begins, first of all, with the older men. And for each one of these demographics, he brings out uh, one quality and, and just kind of holds it up there. And so for the older men, they need to be driven by clear thinking. Or in other words, another word for that is wisdom. Clear thinking wisdom. And you know what? Older men are the backbone of the church. They really are. They are the pillars, the examples, the strength in the background. I pastored a church for nine years that only had two older men. Two. That's it, because it was a new church in a, in a city of London. We had all kinds of young people and young families, but we only had two older men. And those older men, thank God, God gave them to us. They were gifts. Because there's something would happen in the church and the young people were like, what is this? You know what they do? They get on the phone to these older men. And those older men were stalwart. They were strong. And they had a steady hand. And because we had older men who were men of God, who thought clearly, they were able to be a stabilizing factor in the lives and the faith of many of those young men and women and help them to become the young men and women that God wanted them to be. They were a gift, folks, to the church, to the young men and women in the church, and they were certainly a gift to me. Thank God for them. So here's what Paul has to say to the older men. He says, you, however, must teach what is appropriate to sound doctrine. That's to Titus. And he says to Titus, here's this, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, and endurance. The older men. Now, you might be thinking, Who's the older men? Certainly not me. And, and, you know, that's such a relative thing. In fact, in our board meeting this week, I don't know how we got on the topic, but one of our board members, young gal, uh, she was talking, her and her dad were having a discussion about my age. I don't know how they got on to that, but her dad is around my age, and he said, I think Pastor Tom's about 57. Thank you, Roger. You're, you're, you're a blessing. And Naomi said, no, but I won. I was closer. I said, you were 60. Now, I thought about that this week. And I thought, you know what? When you're playing the age game, it's like playing the price is right. You know? If you guess over it, you lose, Naomi. You lost that. <laughs> I'm going with Roger. I'm going with your dad on this one. 57. That's the winner. I like that. But isn't, isn't, isn't age and older and young, isn't that such a relative thing? For instance, you know what? When I go to the 50 plus meeting and I say, well, I'm just like one of you. I'm one of the old folks. They look at me, they go, you're a child. <laughs> you're a kid. And, and if I show up to youth group, it's like, who left the door chart well unlocked? <laughs> <laughs> Who's the old guy? Who let, who let him in here? But you know, if you're one of the young adults that are working with those young people, God bless you, but they look at you as the older guy. Yeah. You're the older girl. And you have to be clear thinking when you're working with those young people, amen? You really do. And, and it doesn't matter really what age you are, it's the age that you're with 
We need to all listen to this and say, you know what, we all need to use wisdom when we're influencing those around us. But I believe Paul is specifically talking here to older men who have raised their families. Their kids are no longer at home, or at least they're living in the basement. <laughs> their kids have grown up, and they have served God all their lives, and they have learned from example, they have knowledge of the word of God, and they have wisdom from experience. And Paul is talking to them, and he says this, you know what, you older men, you need to be sober, and that means to be free from wine. That means to be clear-headed, clean thinking. And we, we hear a lot today about the effects of what it's going to be like once marijuana is legalized. There's a big fear of people driving under the influence of marijuana. In other words, people driving around stoned. And that is well founded because in Colorado, when they allowed recreational marijuana, the accidents increased by 40%. And so we have a nice problem that we're creating for ourselves on the road. But Paul here isn't referring to marijuana, but he's referring that, that the older men should be vigilant and alert and not confused about biblical truth, but their lives need to be focused on Jesus. So they need to be sober, and then they need to be serious, and that doesn't mean walking around with a pout on your face and, and looking down at everybody down your nose, but what that means is to be, in a sense, an honorable person that other people look up to and respect. You're approachable. You're, you're respectful, and people will call you when they don't understand something, and they'll say, hey, man, what's going on here? Can you, help me to, can you help me navigate this? And all that is so needed in our churches today, isn't it? Older men of respect, and we have them here, thank God. We have them here. And, and then Paul says they need to be self-controlled, and the Greek word literally means to be sane. <laughs> in other words, not a crazy old man. Not somebody who you're going, oh, what's, what's old Willard going to say next? What's Willard going to do? I've been in those church meetings where Willard stands up and everybody kind of goes. <gasps> <laughs> Save us from those. But thank God for the ones who are the backbones, who are stable and solid in their relationships with other people in the church and in their relationship with Jesus. Those are the kinds of people that God is saying, if you're an older man, if you've raised your family and their kids, this is what you need to be putting before you in the work of God. William Barclay said one of the most tragic sights in life is a man who has learned nothing through all of the years. That's tragic, folks. Yet yeah, this is what we're supposed to be, and this is why God has saved us and placed us in the body of Christ, to be this kind of a man in his church. And folks, if you're that kind of man, people will be so thankful for you and thankful to God that you're around because you're a gift. Older men are to be sound, Paul says to Titus. He says sound means healthy. They're to be healthy in faith. They need to have a good walk with Jesus, a good close walk with Jesus and faithfulness to the work of Jesus. In other words, they celebrate when they see young men and young women and the church go forward in what God has called it to do. They're healthy in love, love for God's work, love for what the Holy Spirit is doing and working in other people. In other words, they're healthy in love and they don't have grumpy old man syndrome. You know what that is? Oh yeah, I live with one. You know, you're a grumpy old man. Something happens in us, guys. We get to a certain age and we find young people annoying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Hey, hey, hey. Well, I don't find you annoying, son. Uh, <laughs> nice boy. Wonderful boy. Anyway, so, you see it all the time. Well, the youth are doing this. They shouldn't be doing that. And that shouldn't be doing that. And the church shouldn't be doing that. And you shouldn't have a community center. And why did they sing that kind of hymn? And rah, 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 rah. Oh, please, help us. Deliver us from that, Lord God, from being grumpy old men. To being men who are healthy in love and that spreads health throughout the whole church and throughout your whole family and your whole community and then we're to be you know we're, we're to be healthy and endurance you know churches churches ebb and flow don't they i mean when you're in the flow in a church it's like yeah 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 rah 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 but then in order to have that flow you have to have an ebbing 
And then there will be a flow again. And then there will be an ebb. Nobody likes the ebb. You know, pastors during the ebb, it's like, God, are you sending me to another church now? This one's ebbing. Well, it's, ah, it's got to ebb. It's got to ebb because it, God wants to set it up for the next flow. But here's the thing. At this point here, here's what Paul is saying to Timothy. The older men need to be sound in this point and faithful and endurance. They need to be healthy in endurance so they understand the ebb and the flow and they're there in the flow, but they're there in the ebb and they're standing strong. They're Jesus strong. That's the kind of man that God has called you to be. Older men driven by clear thinking as an example and mentor of Christ to encourage the younger men. Well, let's get on and talk about the old women. How many old women we got here today? Oh, you're not as brave as that last group, I want to tell you. <laughs> well, let's ask, men, will you point out the old women this morning for me? Uh, not going there, pastor. I want my Thanksgiving turkey delivered on a plate, not through the air this afternoon, all right? But we are thankful for the older women, and the older women, Paul says here, I think the word here is character. They're driven by character. The older women are driven by character. We, thank, we are thankful for the old women, older women. <laughs> Careful, pastor. I know I'm treading on thin ice here. <laughs> Who lead by influence and example of a godly life. And I want to tell you the truth, that the older women actually have more pull than the older men. <laughs> they honestly do. When they lead and live with character, that is the best, that is the shining quality that God has given to our older women. That is the shining quality. So here's what Timothy says, and they're all, or Paul says to Titus, and they're all character things. Likewise, teach the older women to be uh, reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind and the subject for their husbands so that no one will malign the word of God. One pastor's wife put it this way. She says, as, the, oh, as an older woman and the pastor's wife, I have influence. I am the neck that turns the head. <laughs> oh, yeah. In other words, I lead through character and I lead through influence. And it is many an older woman that has been the guiding counselor and shining light for both men and younger men and younger women. Interesting study about the influence of the women, mothers. They're the strongest role models for children's education. This is a study done in the United Kingdom in Britain. A mother's in, I'm, I'm quoting from the study, a mother's influence was found to be the leading factor over whether children stayed on at school and went on to study at university and to social mobility within the family. By contrast... The educational achievement of fathers made no significant impact on their offspring's, offspring's academic accomplishments. They're the influence. And we influence, ladies influence through character and influence, but many times that influence is much more powerful in the home and in shaping the child than the fathers might be. And that's not a bad thing because I think that's what Paul is pointing to in Titus. Teach the ladies this, that through their character, they have a powerful, powerful influence. Ladies, you may think it doesn't matter. You may think that maybe you're, you're, what you do or what you say doesn't matter a great deal, but I want to tell you, if you're driven by character, you're influencing your family. You're influencing your church. You're influencing people to follow Christ. And your influence is felt. And on this Thanksgiving weekend, we owe a great deal of thanks for the older women in our church and in our lives. Amen. Amen. God is looking for older women to be that. Driven by character, 
older men to be driven by clear thinking or wisdom. Now the younger women. Paul, I, I'm, I'm using this word, but I think what Paul has in mind here is compassion. Let's read that part about younger women again, because they are to be taught by the older women, just to refresh, re, refresh that, urge younger women to love their husbands and children. Okay, that's good, right? Okay, good, got that. Self-controlled and pure. Younger women are all looking at me. Go ahead, Pastor. Keep reading. To be busy at home. You know, when your husband comes home from work, he's had a hard day. Make sure your hair is nice and you've got a nice dress on. When he opens the door, the children need to be neat and have their teeth brushed and their hair combed. And maybe the smell of fresh ba bread baking to greet him. <laughs> Guys, how would we lose that? I don't know. Or did it ever exist? I'm not sure. You know, there is a place where this exists, and it's in a different culture than ours. And it's actually the culture that Paul is writing to. But if you want to find what this would really resemble, it would be Saudi Arabia, where, men, uh, where women are to literally stay in the home. And if they want to go out, they have to have a guy with them. They have to be with their father or their husband or an older brother. They are not allowed to be by themselves. And that was what Paul was, was writing about. So can, can we kind of agree that some of this stuff is not relevant to the church today? Absolutely not. But some of it really is for the younger woman because she leads through her compassion. And at the end of all of this that we can agree on, Paul kind of sums it up by saying, this one word, that she is to be kind, loving kindness. That that is what is to flow from a young woman to her family, to her husband, to her children. But it goes beyond that. It flows, that compassion flows into the world. It flows into the church. And younger women lead by and are driven by that loving kindness. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's gentleness that they are to win people over and bring salvation into their home. Let me tell you, there's a lot of churches that have been saved today because of the women, because of the young women and the compassion that they have. There is a lot of children who have been saved by going the wrong way because of a mother who has loving kindness and compassion. As Paul looks at God and salvation, as he looks at the work of Jesus Christ, here's what he says in chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. When the loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. Many a child and many a home has been saved by a godly mother who modeled the fruit of kindness and gentleness, and God honors that. Young women are to be driven by compassion, to be filled with the Holy Spirit's fruit of loving kindness, understanding, gentleness that flows from them into their home, into their church and into their community. So we have the older men driven, serving Jesus strong, but driven by wisdom. We have the older women, Jesus strong, driven by character. We have younger women, Jesus strong, driven by compassion. And now the young men. <laughs> well, the Bible doesn't have a lot to say about the young men at all. Titus chapter 2, verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled. That's it. No long lists. Just that, self-controlled. Young men are to be driven by self-control. Well, we are thankful for the young men that we have because young men bring zeal and strength to God's work. When they're driven by self-control. And you know what? It seems to me that that's our problem, young men. 
That's our problem, isn't it? Self-control. If we could only, if we could master that, you know what we would master? Ourselves. But we're not good at that. And that's why the Bible points that out. Because he's saying a lot in that. In other words, we need to be master. We need to master and sell ourselves through self-control because it is our greatest challenge. It is the greatest work the Holy Spirit wants to do in us, giving us the fruit of self-control. And by golly, don't wait until you're an old guy like me to start to implement it because it won't work. You'll have lost your life. You'll have ruined whatever God would be able to do through you if you wait. Growing in Christ will help you grow in self-control. You can't wait until you're an older man to do this. We need to have self-control over your anger. Young men can be angry men. And we need to exercise that self-control and that fruit of self-control over our anger. Proverbs 16, verse 32. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit has got mastery over himself than he who captures a city. Young man, we need self-control over anger. This, your parents, your wife, your family, your church, your community, your police department will thank you. Then, young men, we need to have self-control over lust. Psychology today says lust can be defined as the strong, passionate longing or desire for certain things, not only sex, but also food, drink, money, fame, power, knowledge, among other things. You know how many guys have a lust for video games so they don't even go to work? Ancient Christians had a story, it was written by a guy named Dante, and he pictured people in hell who had been driven by lust as being blown like leaves in a whirlwind. Not in control of themselves, but blown by every lust and desire that comes along. Here's what Paul had to say to 2 Timothy, another young man, chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts. Guys, we got to get this thing under control and we got to do it when we're young. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, and those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. We've got to control ourselves. We've got to get out of that whirlwind and we've got to be in charge, not something out there. And we need to have self-control over our arrogance. Because <laughs> young men can be arrogant. Sometimes I think of when I was a young pastor, I think, oh, I, I, God must be gracious that he didn't strike me, <laughs> but forgave me just for my arrogance, for what came out of my mouth sometimes. Proverbs said, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And then he goes on. God says, I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. You see, Pride and arrogance bring evil behavior and perverse speech. And we need God to control and to temper us and to be in control of our lives, men. And the whole Holy Spirit will work in you and he's working in you to tackle some of those pressures and desires of anger, of lust, and of arrogance and pride that would destroy your life. We need, we need to say, Lord, thank you that you... You care for me enough, and you give me the strength and the power to get those things under control. So I, I, I want to close at this time. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back. Folks, we need to be Jesus strong and people driven by positive attitudes. And, and, and Paul here deals with Titus with the congregation. He says, teach sound doctrine that will make these things happen in your church. That the older men will be wise and they'll put that in front of them. They'll be clear thinking. That the older women will be of women of character and influence. They will be so powerful. That, that the young women will be women of compassion that will bring salvation into their home and their marriages and their families and their church and their community. They'll connect people to me for the young men, that they'll be men that will be strong in Jesus and not be 
blowing with a, like a whirlwind, but will have self-control and master themselves and their passions and their lusts and serve me with all of their heart. That's God's will for you today. That's God's will for our church. And that's what God is doing in your lives. Now, as we prepare for the giving of thanks offering today, this goes towards our mortgage. We want to just thank God. We want to praise God. But first, I want to pray. Lord, you know our hearts. I pray for the older men in our church here today, that, Lord, you would bless them with clear thinking and wisdom. And, Lord, help them be the men and the strong men and backbone of the church that we need in these times of turbulence and uncertainty. Lord, I pray for the older women that they would lead with character and that their influence would be felt and so powerful as something that would just be like a river that would flow underneath us. Lord, I pray for the younger women that you would minister to them and that their compassion would just flow from them, Lord. And it is through your loving kindness that you saved us and through their loving kindness that you bring salvation into the lives of their kids and their homes and their husbands and their church. Lord, may that be felt in our community. And Lord, for the young men, that you make us strong in Jesus. And Lord, make us stand and have mastery over ourselves to serve you with all our heart, soul, and strength. In Jesus' name, thank you. We just bless you. Thank you for your giving. And we just pray that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving weekend with your home and your family. May God bless you as you go. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this week's message. If you would like to know more about our church, visit kingsvillechurch.com. Thanks for tuning in and don't forget to join us next week.